back with you on this beautiful April day. And uh, we, it's warm enough that I shut the boiler off. I'm just heating with the firewood. So I'm enjoying that fireplace insert. And I feel so green right now. <laughs> so we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant, O oh merciful God, that we may ardently desire, prudently examine, truthfully acknowledge, and perfectly accomplish what is pleasing to thee for the praise and glory of thy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> so right now we're moving into what is typically called the hidden life of Jesus, and then the public life of Jesus. So that would be after Christmas, everything that's kind of from his year one until, let's just say, he turned 30. That's when his public life started with his baptism. Uh, with his baptism. Uh, and uh, then the public life was from his baptism until, you could say, his passion and death. But could almost exclude the passion and death in a certain sense. But there's this hidden life and public life. Before he started his ministry, the time he lived quietly with his uh, father, stepfather and his mother, and then the public life was all of his preaching. And as uh, we'll, this is covered in paragraphs uh, 5, 16, just for you, you might want to write this down. Uh, his private life is from 5, 16 to 5, 34. I will try to get through most of that. We'll see what happens. <clears throat> then his public life begins with the baptism of the Lord, paragraph 5, 35, until... 5.50, no, 5.60, um, nine, or 5.70. <clears throat> and then we move on to the next article of the faith. Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. So right now, of course, we're going to be treating or reflecting on praying over his hidden life in his public life and what it means to us for our salvation. That is actually falls under the article we're currently on, which is, I be, uh, he, we believe in Jesus Christ who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So we're still we're covering all of this under that article. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it was, as I read through the paragraphs, something kind of struck me. Um, that when you look at the, the articles of the faith kind of summarize and focus on the main points, the most important elements of our faith, you could say, kind of summarizing the Word of God. So it's interesting how we jump from Article 3 to Article 4. We go from conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, and then we jump to he was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. It's almost as if his being born is uh, very important for our salvation, and his suffering and dying is very important. But it almost like it skips over his private life and his public life. Like it's not quite as important. Now everything's important, but there's always they call it the hierarchy of truths. What's and uh, and then of course we go on to he descended into hell. And then on the third day rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's Article 6 and Article 7. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Article 8 is, I believe, in the Holy Spirit. We shift to the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to Jesus, it's interesting. Um, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and died, went into hell to defeat hell, to bring his power even there, went to the right hand of God the Father, and one day we confess he will come and judge the living and the dead. He will finally, definitively establish his kingdom. But his hidden life and his public life seem to be kind of left out. So uh, we'll talk, just keep that in the back of your mind. So we're going to deal with this under this article. That's what the Catechism does. The article conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. So let's take a look at uh, paragraph 516 and 517. This is kind of an introduction to our grappling with what does his hidden life and what does his public life have to say to us. So 516, Christ's whole earthly life 
his words and deeds, his silences and sufferings, indeed his manner of being and speaking is revelation of the Father. Jesus can say, quote, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, and the Father can say, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. That's John 14, verse 9, and Luke chapter 9, verse 35. Because our Lord became man in order to do his Father's will, even the least characteristics of his mysteries manifest God's love amongst us, uh, 1 John 4, 9, God's love amongst us. So, <clears throat> then there was a cross-reference to paragraph 2708, about, and that, that's from the section on prayer, and I'll just read that briefly, it's kind of interesting. So, every little word he said, everything he did, can speak to us of God the Father. So as Christians, we're not satisfied just to reflect upon his incarnation and then jump to uh, his suffering and death and resurrection. We want to know what he was doing when he was 11 years old, when he just turned 11, and uh, he had his first conversation with him. We want to know all this stuff. We just, that Christians, now we don't need to, but it's, it's secondary because what were the four reasons for the incarnation? Remember we talked about this? To make expiation to manifest the love of God to us, and then to show us how to love as He loves, and then finally, to share with us divine life. Do we need to know everything that happened during His hidden life? No. That's why it's not in the Bible. However, it's interesting that some Gospels have more about His hidden life and His private life than others. Kind of interesting. So we'll, we'll kind of grapple with that and reflect upon it, because I think God kind of to satisfy us and okay, I'll let you know a little bit. Like after he was born, uh, Joseph, they had to flee to Egypt, remember? And they had to come back and the Magi came. That's not in the Gospel of Mark, which is the oldest Gospel. So it's like the, the oldest Gospel was written, I'm just speculating here, and the Christians were, the early church said, ah, this isn't enough, we need more. <laughs> so they kept praying and reflecting and they wrote Matthew and they wrote Luke, which has a lot more about his hidden life. Although Mark, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, we, 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 uh, you, next step, just where does it begin? What's the first thing that the Gospel of Mark, the oldest Gospel, where does it begin with? No, that's the Gospel of John. It begins with uh, Jesus' baptism. His baptism. So in other words, it starts with his public life. So you could almost make an argument that his public life is more important than his hidden life. And I would say, well, look at the Gospel of Mark, the Word of God. It was written starting with his public life. You see what I'm saying? And I w I'm wondering if you actually counted chapters and verses, I wonder if there's more chapters and verses focusing on his birth and on his suffering and death than on other things. Of course, it's probably not right because we have the whole Sermon of the Mound in Matthew. We have a lot on his miracles. But again, what was the purpose of all his miracles? And, um, yeah, what was the purpose? To manifest who he was? You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So I'm just speculating, thinking out loud here. So all the miracles, yes, were to save the particular people that he was healing. But more important than that was to show us who he was. By miracles and his power, he manifested that he is the Messiah, the one who is to come, uh, the son of the living God who will renew the whole human race. So everything's kind of ordered to revealing who he is. That's what the incarnation, you could say, is about. You know, he is the son of God. And also achieving the end for which he came. In fact, when he worked miracles, Remember how he'd tell people, now don't go tell anybody. Now why would he do that? I'm, I, we, we can debate this, but the one, one scripture commentator said, well the reason was, it wasn't his time to die yet and to make expiation for our sins. He needed more time to teach. You know, he needed more time to teach, so he say, now, he'd work the miracles, but what was more important was that he would suffer and die for us and redeem us at the right time and in the right way. And he didn't want that to happen too soon. He needed his three years of ministry. So he'd say, now don't go tell people this, but they did anyway. But maybe they told, it gave him a little bit more time. So 
it's, uh, it's almost as if the miracles came, it was to reveal who he was, but he didn't want it to be revealed too soon because it might interfere with one of the, the most important reasons he came, to become the Lamb of God, to suffer and die for us. So sometimes you can get hints of what's most important, what everything is for in that way too. We get it in the creed, how it almost, there's no article that spoke, focuses specifically on his hidden or his public life. So, so the, anyway, let's take a look at this. Let's continue with, let's see if we can get any more insights from the church's reflection on scripture here. Um, number 517, Christ's whole life is a mystery of redemption. Interesting. So in other words, it's saying his hidden life, much of which we don't know, his public life, every day, all of it was for the sake of our redemption. So when we reflect upon his being discovered in the temple and his mother and father saying, we're worried about you, where were you? Don't you know I have to be about my heavenly father's business? We, we have to reflect upon it asking ourselves, what does this tell us what unique insight will this give us into his redeeming and saving us? Because his passion, death, resurrection is key. I mean, it, um, even the Christmas takes sec his second fiddle to his passion, suffering, and death. Uh, Easter is the greatest celebration. Christmas is for the sake of Easter. Yeah, okay. So Christ's whole life is a mystery of redemption. Yeah, yeah. Redemption comes to us above all through the blood of his cross. And there's a footnote there, Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verse 7, Colossians 1, 13 to 14, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. And since this is supposed to be a Bible study, let's look it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I get a little nervous when I go too on a, far on about theologizing. But okay, so his whole life is a mystery of redemption. Redemption comes to us above all through the blood of his cross. But this mystery is at work throughout Christ's entire life. That's why we're going to look at his hidden and public life. We want to get more insights into the, res the, the suffering, the death, the resurrection. Okay, now we got quotes here. Ephesians 1.7. Ephesians 1 7. <clears throat> Fulfillment through Christ. In him we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. Okay, let's just keep that in mind. Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. He delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. 1 Peter 1.18. and 19. So I'll start with 17. Now if you invoke as father him who judges impartially according to each one's works, conduct yourself with reverence during the time of your sojourning, realizing that you were ransomed from your futile conduct handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a spotless, unblemished lamb. Okay, so, Christ's whole life is a mystery of redemption. This is the big emphasis here. Redemption comes above all through the blood of his cross. 
But this mystery is at work throughout his entire life. And then he gives several examples. And in my notes, I said, look up all quotes and discuss. So that's what we're going to do, paragraph 117. Christ's whole life, okay, is a mystery of redemption. And then already in his incarnation, through which by becoming poor, he enriches us by his poverty. One eight, so let's look at 2 Corinthians 8.9. For you know the gracious act of our Lord. No, that's wrong. Gracious. Did I say eight, nine? Yeah, I did. For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that for your sake he became poor, although he was rich, so that his poverty might, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now here's a good example. Okay, let me read that again. Just want to point out an example of his hidden in his an uh, 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 something from his hidden life that points to the uh, suffering the meaning of the suffering death and resurrection of Jesus so for you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ that for your sake he became poor although he was rich so that by his poverty you might become rich now we know that ultimately happened on the cross. Uh, for actually, it's, he came down from the right hand of God the Father. Uh, remember that famous passage, Philippians uh, chapter two. Uh, Although he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself. So he became was rich, and he became poor, and he took on human flesh and he lowered himself even to death, death on the cross um, and so forth. So he was rich, he became poor so that we could become rich. So he, and ultimately dying on the cross is the ultimate pouring out of himself so that we could become rich. But in a way, we already see this in his hidden life. We, now, you don't see this in the Gospel of Mark. So the early Christians said, we want another Gospel. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit gave them three more. And in Luke and in Matthew, you see, just one second, so you will see that it's revealed that he was born in Bethlehem and where there was no inn for him to stay in. So where did he stay? A stable or a cave? where poor people live see so he was born into poverty right poverty and oh and and uh, where did they put him in a nice beautiful crib manger. a manger which points to something else doesn't it eucharist, eucharist. he's going to be consumed by us huh? he's going to he's going to become the living bread come down from heaven and he who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has no life within him. So already in his hidden life, it's pointing to uh, these main teachings, you see? So now you had a question. Yes, Jim. We always assume that he was poor. His dad had a very good job. Yeah, yeah. And more than likely, his son, his most usual Jewish family, would adopt his dad's dress. And then Aaron's son was building some for it. Which is right next to Jerusalem. And there was, job, I'm sure, jobs and money. Well, all we know from Scripture is that he, they couldn't afford, or they didn't have enough money to bribe anybody. Believe me, if he was rich, he would have been able to find a place for his wife. I'm just speculating. We don't know. But I would argue, go ahead, continue. Make your argument. Uh, just those nice people from uh, Persia dropped a pile of gold. Yeah. That's that's true. There was there, there, there was <laughs> there was uh, gold, incense, and myrrh, right? Yes, Steve. I've always imagined that gold is a state of It's yeah. How much we don't know. How much gold we we don't. Uh, but the the theme is definitely he was poor. And remember, I would back this up by saying Mary, his mother, became one of the poorest of the poor. Remember, if Joseph would have had so much money, she wouldn't have ended up being a widowed 
I mean, in the Bible, let me put it this way. It doesn't, it doesn't actually overturn your argument, but scripturally and theologically, when we look at the Blessed Mother, she was one of the poorest of the poor. She was a childless widow, right? So did she have a bunch of gold stashed away thanks to St. Joseph's great business? I don't know. It doesn't, it, there's nothing in scripture, and I, it doesn't quite ring true to that. But nice try, Jim. <laughs> um, I still say he was poor, and it, it, show, it, pour, it shows to the ultimate poverty where he pours himself out so we can become rich. But I like good, good, good effort, but I, I don't want to believe that. <laughs> I, and also, go ahead. Yeah. At the presentation, they could only afford the. Bingo! There's your best argument. Sorry, Jim, you've just lost that but argument. <laughs> Was the right, right, because... We don't know that. Uh, no, 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 I think... I think he was born, and then the, the, the Magi came when they were still in Bethlehem. Oh. And then when they made the presentation, I would say that's after. But they're... Don't press it too much, but base, yeah. it's very... Here's the thing, whatever happened today, we don't even know how much gold it was. Right. But the thing is this. They did offer two turtle doves, which was, which was for the poor people. So, so it's pretty clear. Also, we see the poverty of being. Now, I'm, I'm going to the hidden life. What happened because of Herod? There, there was the, he killed the innocents, right? Do you have a question back there, Gary? No, what I'm trying to do is we get a, a lot of requests from the online folks to hear the comments. I'm trying to hold this mic up so they can hear what's going on. Oh, around. I'm sorry. No, yes. no, don't apologize. I'll try to repeat this. All right. So I think we all explained, Jim, Jim was arguing that, uh, well, he had a very, St. Joseph might have had a very successful business, so Jesus was rich. Uh, and I, I'm just saying, well, if, like, uh, another one of our guests, what's your first name again? Yeah. Like Ann mentioned, uh, well, actually, in the Bible, it says he gave, they sacrificed two turtle doves, which is for the poor. So it's pretty strong evidence that he was poor. We don't know how much gold was given to them by the Magi. Um, but the whole idea here, so now we're going to get lost in all these details. Remember, this is about Jesus became poor so we could become rich. And the point I'm trying to make is that this, the most definitive way this happened was when he was born, when he emptied himself, but then it went so far as to emptying himself on the cross so that we could be redeemed. Expiation was made for us so that we could become rich. He became poor that we became rich. And in his private life, you see hints of this. For example, um, what was the first example I gave? Uh, he was, uh, oh, he, he was born, they couldn't find an inn to lay, and he was put in a manger. Um, and also I would say he was in exile. He was another type of poverty because, because of King Herod, who was trying to kill him. He had to flee for his life, another type of poverty so we could be rich. These are examples that all are ordered towards giving a deeper understanding that every moment of his life was ordered to pouring himself out. He, uh, so they had to flee to Egypt uh, to, uh, and already we see a hint that there's going to be persecution of the early church in the death of the Holy Innocents because it's very interesting the feast of the Holy Innocents is December 26th so we celebrate Christmas all this joy and wonder and then all of a sudden we've got all these poor innocents it's like boy does that throw cold water on my Christmas joy but it's, it's, it's interesting so even in the Bible so I think we have a question here Oh, definitely. De definitely. But that's true. I mean, he went from being at the right hand of God the Father in all of his glory and was born as a little child. That's a type of poverty. He went from being rich to poor. Um, but also, money's not the only way of his poverty. You're right. That's right. So even if they had a lot of gold, 
but they didn't because then they wouldn't have bought two turtle doves. So I, but, but your point is well taken. Lots of other types of poverty. Uh, the poverty of being in exile. They had to flee to Egypt. And in the Gospel of Matthew, that's recorded. And it says, and this is to fulfill the scripture that I called, I called my son out from Egypt. That's in Matthew. And, and John, I'll get to you in a second. I called my son out from Egypt. Now, who was God's son originally that was called out of Egypt? Remember we talked about the, the theme of a son. Who is, who is God's firstborn son in the Old Testament? No, it's not a person. It's a people. The Israelites. I had to call forth my son from Egypt. So now you have Jesus Christ being equated with the people. So just like Israel is the son of God, Jesus is the son of God. So again, the exile, poverty, but also in that case, we're foreshadowing that just that, that he has his uh, uh, beloved son, just like Israel. But so there's a poverty there. Um, yeah. So John, go ahead. For me, it, it makes me think about uh, the Father had a perfect plan. And Jesus lived that perfect plan. And part of that plan was whatever the Word says or the Bible says, He did. That was what was needed to be done to pay the price for our sin. For us to be right with God. Right. Creator. Right. Um, so, so, you know, whether he had the opportunity to have wealth or not, I think Jesus could have been wealthy. He denied himself just as we are to yeah. deny ourselves. Right. Uh, for obedience to our Creator who is now our Father, of course. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, think about it when he had to pay taxes. He was, they had nothing, but he said, oh, just go and catch a fish, and you'll, you'll find a coin. So, he, but he, only, he didn't get five coins so that he could, they could have nice dinners for the next week. Just enough, just enough to pay the tax. Oh, just what we need, my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. No, good point. So, he, you know, obviously, um, abject poverty is not a good thing. But to live a simple life and not to be wasteful and whatnot is, is, is good too. So there's that balance. Um, but again, this is about, so let's go here to the Catechism. Already in his incarnation through which by becoming poor, he enriches us with his poverty. And I, I quoted that quote and then I gave some examples that came to mind off the top of my head. Uh, in his hidden life, ah, I like this. Um, so. The mystery is at work throughout his entire life. In his hidden life, which by his submission atones for our disobedience. I like that. We, so everything he did undoes everything that we did poorly as a human race. So unlike us, he was obedient to his parents. We saw this um, at the temple. He said, well, I, don't you know I have to be about the my will of my father, my heavenly father, and yet it's even though it seems like he's bucking his parents, it says in scripture, but then he went home and he was obedient to them. Unlike so Jesus does everything right to undo everything we did wrong. That includes not just his suffering and death, but every moment of his life. There was another example. Oh, I'm gonna forget it now. But there there's um there is an example. So um, submit. There's, let's take a look what I thought would be good well let's keep going through this so what example was there number one Luke chapter 251 uh, this is where he's obedient I bet you that's exactly what I was referring to um, Luke chapter 2 verse 51 he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them okay so there it is. And Jesus advanced in wisdom. Okay, so obviously in his hidden life, by his submission, he atoned for our disobedience. Um, uh, in his resurrection, by which he justifies us. Okay, I'm, let's see, what is that? 184. 
I'm going to skip that one, in his healings and exorcisms by which he took on our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, that's an interesting quote, actually. I was looking at that. Let's take a look at this. This is an example where the New Testament takes a quote from the Old Testament and kind of spins it a bit or, or kind of twists it a bit to, to make it fit. That's not the right way to put it. But I'm going to put it that way anyway. <laughs> I don't know what. Well, let's take a look at this. Matthew, so Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. See, the, see one of the, yeah. See, a lot of, when, whenever the New Testament writers quoted the Old Testament, they were quoting the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation. I've talked about this before, of the Hebrew. And it, that was written at around 200 BC. Most Jews couldn't read Hebrew, so they needed a Greek translation. And the Jews had great reverence for the Septuagint. It comes from the word 70. And the tradition is that 70 Jewish scribes sat down with all the texts of the Hebrew and they translated the Bible. And so there was 70 examples of the Septuagint, 70 different translators. Now you don't have to believe this, but it's a, one, it's a, it's a neat little tradition. It's not, it's not the story that matters, it's the theological point that they're trying to make. And so the idea was these 70 different theologians sat down, or Jewish scribes, translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and then when they sh sh put all 70 of these translations together, they were word for word the same. Now that's a miracle. <laughs> yeah, that's but the idea was, the idea was, the, to the Jews, the word of God was, you know, sacred, and it had to be preserved, especially since the destruction of the temple, and they, had, they no longer had their priesthood or the sacrifices of the temple. They were, they, the, Pharisee, the Pharisees kind of took over, and that's where you had the, the um, uh, synagogue tradition, which we have to this day. Uh, the Sadducees died out, but the, the Pharisees continued to read God's word, reflect upon it. So it was absolutely critical that they had the right translation. So there's this tradition. But the problem is when we actually look at the Hebrew texts, there's things that don't quite click. And so sometimes the New Testament writers will quote the Old Testament in the Septuagint, and then when you actually look at the Hebrew, doesn't quite work. This, th this is an example here where he took on our infirmities and bore our diseases. We'll, we'll just take a look at this. At least this is my take on it. I could be wrong, of course. But Matthew chapter 8, verse 17 is where it's quoted. All right, so this is from his public life, of course, his miracles. Uh, when it was evening, they brought him many who were possessed by demons. He drove out the spirits by a word and cured all the sick to fulfill. In other words, not just to cure them. There was a higher reason. To fulfill what had been said by Isaiah, the prophet. He took away our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now that's a reference to the suffering servant. But for me, so now I know he, when he suffered on the cross... He was certainly bearing our diseases, suffering what we, what, what we should have suffered. But here it's kind of being explained that he healed people to take away our infirmities and bore our diseases. It's, I guess it might work. It's kind of a, a different way of looking at it. Um, let's take a look at the original. I, so it's from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Yet it was our pain that, okay, so this is the suffering servant. Uh, um, so chapter 53, verse 4, I'm going to back up a bit to verse 2. He had no majestic bearing to catch our eye, no beauty to draw us to him. He was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, knowing pain, like one from whom you turn your face, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet... It was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. So what I'm saying, it's interesting how he quotes that and says, this, his healing people, 
is a fulfillment of this text. He bore our pain. So I don't know as a physician, when I heal somebody, how I'm bearing that person's pain. So it's kind of taking this Old Testament passage and applying it in a little different way. I mean, there's, that's, that's typical, I think the word is midrash, I'm not sure, but yeah. Brother, who's Isaiah referring to that he's writing back in the Old Testament? Well, uh, yes, okay, what's wrong? Okay. Repeat. Oh, yes. question. Yes, the, the question, thank you. So uh, Bob asked, who is uh, the prophet Isaiah referring to when he's talking about this suffering servant? Okay, so now as Christians, we, Jesus, Jesus. Now, well, it wasn't, but, that wasn't known yet. Well, you know, so there's several levels of meaning. What was the original? Now you're pressing me. Uh, I, 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 some would say, some would say, Israel as a people were suffering. Remember, in this is Third Isaiah, I believe, chapter uh, thirty-six, the, the, chapter fifty to sixty-six is Third Isaiah. In other words, it was written later. Uh, the book of Isaiah was written by several people, and during this period, Israel was in rough shape. She, had, I believe. She, Historically, this text was written when they got back from from exile, and, and, but they were still they were very poor and weak and vulnerable, still rebuilding the temple. And I think a lot of Jewish people ask themselves, if God, if we're God's firstborn son and we're so special, why are we so wretched? And I, well, part of it was there for their sins, but here Isaiah kind of says, well, actually. We are, in a way, we, through us, all nations will be blessed. You think of what God said to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. Um, and so they're kind of saying, through our suffering, we are kind of like a sacrificial lamb. Now, this is just one way. This is my opinion. You, you're going to have to check with other scholars. But I would argue that would be one good example where Israel herself was seen as a suffering servant. Okay? But it, as Christians, we recognize that it's the Messiah, uh, Jesus. Yes, Jim. The footnote on that, it says 52, 13, and 53, that the last of the servants of the Lord, Oracle, the extraordinary description of the civil servant, by his voluntary suffering, atones for the sins of the people, and saves them from the punishment at the lands of God. Only in Jesus Christ is the prophecy. Okay, all right, so, so Jim just said only in Jesus is it fulfilled, but, and that's true, he's quoting a footnote in our Bible on this verse, um, but I, I wanted to see, oh, here it is, here, I was right, I, re, I read these footnotes years ago and sometimes it sticks, um, the servant, the servant is described in ways that identify him with Israel. So I would answer that most scholars look at this originally in its original meaning in that way. For example, a good example is um, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. The king Ahaz has said, um, uh, uh, a, uh, this year next you know, a young woman will bear a child. Uh, the Greek word is, can be translated young woman or a virgin. Well, when we quote it, in, in Matthew quoted, it was, a virgin shall be found with child. In the original historical setting, uh, the first primary literary me literal meaning in the Old Testament was that this king would finally, through his young wife, have a child, a, a son, who would sit on his throne. In the Old Testament, his kingship was threatened, and people were talking about overthrowing him. Like, you could say, well, my... my <clears throat> his nephew, my son, should be the king because he has no sons and he's not a very good king and since he has no son, let's get rid of him now. And his kingship was being threatened and the prophet said, stop worrying, a young woman shall be found with child. Your wife will have a child. And when that happens, when everyone knows that she's pregnant, a lot of these naysayers that want to replace you will back off. That would be, so, so there's an example. So, so in this original suffering servant, probably they, they were getting, they, remember, God reveals things slowly and, and partially. It's not that 
the Christian interpretation by St. Matthew is wrong. It's just the full interpretation. So there was already in the time of Isaiah, in I want to say like um, the year 500 or 400 BC, that there was a purpose for suffering, that suffering can bring about good, and that we as a people, our suffering has value. What they didn't realize that was that there would be a particular person whose suffering would have even more value because that person is God himself. And so any of his suffering more than makes up expiation. You can have a whole race that suffers unjustly or excessively and it can make restitution, but not like this particular son of theirs that were the son of King David that would be born. So the idea that we as a people are suffering for to bring about good or healing was the first step to realizing that a particular person could be called to that role. You see what I'm say, saying? So originally it was the suffering servant was collectively the whole of Israel, but the Holy Spirit was leading them to an even deeper thought that the descendant of King David would be enthroned not on the throne of King David, that just through a just as through a tree death entered the world so through a tree the wood of the cross life would be brought to the world you see how Jesus turns everything around it's kind of like he recapitulates in fact that's a, something that is mentioned in paragraph 118 let's get to that right now uh, so Christ's whole life is a mystery of recapitulation so there's this idea that Everything we messed up, he comes and he does right. We were disobedient to our parents, he was obedient to his. Um, we, were, we, uh, we were insulted and we slapped the person back. Jesus is insulted, he turns the other cheek. So everything in his life is, and it's ultimately culminated in his suffering and death on the cross. But in his private and public life, it's all there in different hints and it's all being recapitulated. He's doing it the right way to undo the wrong way we as a race and individually have done it. So let's take a look at this paragraph 518. Christ's whole life is a mystery of recapitulation. All Jesus did, said, and suffered had for its aim restoring fallen man to his original vocation. By the way, fallen man, one of the titles of Jesus is he is the son of man. The son, the son of man. And it's a very mysterious title. And different theologians said, well, if he said he was the son of God, he'd have got crucified too soon. He didn't want to reveal the fullness of it. It's a mysterious title. It goes back to the prophet Daniel. He talks about the son of man coming on the clouds. Was it a powerful angel? Was it um, God? I think the son of man. I'm, yeah, so was it an angel like St. Michael? It was a mysterious title, but in my opinion, I think the best explanation is he's the son of man, like, like you'd say, I have five sons, but this is my son. Yeah, those are my sons, but this is my son. Of course, that makes them jealous. But like, or you talk about a firstborn son, but uh, Jesus is the son of man. Yeah, we're sons and daughters of man, but we're not very good examples. We're all sinners, but Jesus is the son of man. He's the way humanity should have been. So he, think about the title, Son of Man. Like, he is the one who did everything right. He's the man, the one man who truly pleases the Father. And through that, everything's recapitulated. And that's why in Christ and through Christ, we, can, we will suffer and die, but we will rise to eternal life. Everything is through him. It's very, it's very powerful. Now, this, there's actually a, a biblical quote that I want us to take a look at that this is based on. All Jesus did, said, and suffered had for its aim restoring fallen man to his original okay what do we got oh Saint Irenaeus reflecting on this does a powerful job let's read this quote Saint Irenaeus was one of the great he was the great theologian of our church before Augustine Augustine kind of replaced him or uh, you know took the lead I Irenaeus died in oh, I should know this one. Yeah, I believe 107 so I mean he was like right after the Apostles no I got that wrong 202 202 he died and he was a, a Greek who became a bishop of Lyon France out in the wilderness now the French would be offended if I said that France is a wilderness but back then in 202 that was a barbaric area so he went out there and he was and I visited his tomb St. Irenaeus okay enough of that so here's what he said when Christ became incarnate 
and was made man, he recapitulated in himself the long history of mankind and procured for us a shortcut to salvation. So that what we had lost in Adam, that is, being in the image and likeness of God, we might recover in Christ Jesus. Beautiful. For this reason, Christ experienced all the stages of life, thereby giving communion with God to all men. And he experienced those stages, and he lived them the right way. Now let's go to the Bible quote that Irenaeus is really basing this on. And I want to just see, I, I, I know it's a F, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> just a second. Now what was that? 186. Somehow... Anyway, I don't, in my own research, just look at, let's look at this. Um, it's not here in the catechism. I must have found it indirectly. Um, Ephesians, where are you? Glad we're getting through. Yeah, here it is. So I, I'm interested in your translations. Um, so fulfillment through Christ. We'll start with verse, chapter 1, verse 7. In him... Remember, in, in St. Paul's writings, in him, through him, <laughs> for him. I love how these little prepositions have a lot more meaning in the Bible than they do in our typical speech. Yeah, okay, so in him, we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. Are you guys with me? Chap chapter 1, verse 7, Eph Ephesians. Okay. Okay, yep, all right, here we, got it? Okay, so. In accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, I'm on verse 8 now, that he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of time to sum up, there it is, to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. I use the word rec recapitulation, but in my translation, it means to sum up. So as, so as a plan for the fullness, of, in the fullness of time to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. Anyone have a different translation? Reestablish. Ah, reestablish. So, so in my Bible, its recapitulation is to sum up all things in Christ. I like that translation. To reestablish. Let's read the whole thing, Joe. Uh, to reestablish all things in Christ. To reestablish all things in Christ. Yes, we got another one over here. Mine says, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Christ. Ooh, to unite. All things. So to sum up, to reestablish, to unite all things. Isn't this cool when we've got a word in Greek and we just struggle to translate it? But these all point to it. So to reestablish what was disestablished through our sin, uh, to sum up, and what did you say again? To unite. To, unite, tie, it to tie it all together. I like that, to tie it all together. Anyone else with a different translation? Okay, good. Kind of cool, huh? <laughs> this is like the high point I was trying to get to today. <laughs> and it actually happened. This never happens. All right. So, good. So I like this. So in a way, when we reflect on his hidden life and his public life, this is certainly the hidden life is the least important in the hierarchy of truths. But it's there to help us appreciate uh, the most significant that he was, he came down from God, he emptied himself to become one of us in the incarnation. He took on flesh uh, to suffer and die for us. But, and, and then he, to make expiation so that through his poverty we would become rich. But then everything here in some way should point to, oh, we, we kind of talked about, in fact, that what I wanted to do, maybe we won't flip the pages, but we, if you look at, let's look at the, God, I want to show you some examples of the hidden life that are in Matthew and Luke that are not in Mark. So let's look at, let's look at Mark, just chapter one. No, I'm, I'm kind of just running with, sometimes I read the catechism and I look at the Bible quotes and then I kind of just think of some different things that I learned in theology and run with it. So I'm being very, we're kind of 
departing from the catechism, so please forgive me. <laughs> anyway, so you'll notice in Mark, it begins with the preparation for the public ministry of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. And actually, it begins with the preaching of John the Baptist. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. John appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Um, and then it, the next thing is in verse 9, it happened in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. That's the first mention we have of him. Nothing about being presented in the temple or being born in Bethlehem. It just, he came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. Coming out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit like a dove descended upon him. And a voice from the heavens said, you are my beloved son with you I am well pleased. Then there's the temptation of Jesus. By the way, continuing to show how, so, so in, in Matthew it begins practically with his public life. There's nothing about his hidden life. And what's interesting, the temptation of Jesus in the desert for 40 years. Remember we talked about how Jesus recapitulates everything, sums everything up, um, unites everything, uh, uh, reestablishes why this going into the desert for 40 years was undoing the sins of the past do, what do you think his being in the 40 days in the desert and doing it right what did that heal and recapitulate in the history of Israel anybody 40 years in the desert oh you're so good okay everyone knew that 40 years in the desert so the, remember Israel is the father's firstborn son right even Matthew says that uh, when Jesus came out of Egypt with Joseph and Mary, it was, uh, he was calling forth his son from Egypt. So Israel went into the desert. And what did Israel do in the desert? The firstborn son sinned. Yeah, they, they complained and whined, we're sick of this food, we're this and that. And they were disobedient, and they were brought to the Holy Land, and oh, they're, they're so powerful, they're just like giants, these people. These, uh, and, and they didn't trust God, and God said, fine, you're not going to go into the problem. Your whole generation is going to die out in the desert, and I'm going to create a new people. And, and, but Jesus goes in the desert, and he defeats the devil, unlike ancient Israel, right? And that, there's an example of Jesus recapitulating. In Jesus, God the Father, it's like God the Father is looking down. Finally, a man who does it right. Finally. All right, I'll forgive the rest of your, I'll forgive the rest of your brothers and sisters if they try to live in you, my firstborn son, my perfect son, then I'll forgive the rest and I'll welcome them in. Finally, a, a son I can be proud of. That's, see what, that, that's what it is. Yes, John. So you could say that all the other prophets in some way fell, f f fell short or were even false prophets, whereas Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So yes, that's another example. Yeah, it's very interesting. So we could go through, let's, we could, let's see what else. So we had the temptation in the desert. Um, let's go, let's, okay, so, and then it goes to the call of the first disciples. Um, let's, let's take a look at Matthew. Now Matthew talks much more about the hidden life, I think. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, let's just breeze through it. So the first part is the genealogy of Jesus. So basically it identifies him as a descendant of King David. That was very important because the Jewish people were looking for the return of the king. And we have great literature like the Lord of the Rings. The whole third part is about the return of the king, right? <laughs> the king of Gondor. And... Uh, so, I mean, that's all based in the Bible. That was not some, it's, it's a theme uh, that's not original to um, Tolkien. But, so you got this genealogy. By the way, there was a Jewish convert to the faith that was talking about this and said um, that with the destruction of the temple, the Romans were so ticked off at the Jews for their revolt, they leveled the temple, and all that was left is a wailing wall. It's not even a wall, it's the foundation. 
and they also found all the genealogies of their king, their kings, all the genealogies, and they burnt them around the what, year 150. So there are no other genealogies. The Jews have no genealogy. We, we have the only one. It's in our Bible. So the only genealogy that establishes. So this Jew, this Jewish convert basically said, this is the, and it was one of the reasons he converted, was it's like this is the only, there's no way for us to establish who the true Messiah is anymore. It's all been destroyed. Well, this is the only this is only genealogy that exists. So that helped them realize this must be the Messiah. There's there's other things that that they um, I don't want to go down that road. But anyway, so the genealogy is very important. Uh, the birth of the visit of the Magi. Um, what is that prophesying? Again, this points to the purpose of his death and resurrection. Remember, many times Jesus said, I can't, I have been called to heal, to go to Israel, not to uh, the Gentiles. Remember the Syrophoenician woman with the child that was sick? She said, well, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table. <laughs> but Jesus said, well, for, for this kind of faith, go home, your daughter's healed. But you could see how Jesus first and foremost came to minister to the Israelites, and yet already in chapter 2, we hear the visit of the Magi, you're already seeing a hint in his hidden life to the fact that he came not just for the Jews, but for all people. Because the Magi represent the nations coming to Jesus and acknowledging him as their king and savior. It's a foreshadowing, a hint that one day all nations would come. In fact, in our tradition, it doesn't say in the Bible, but in our tradition, there's three Magi. And look at the statues. One's African, one's Asian, one's Caucasian. How many continents did we know about back in Jesus' time? Three. Of course, we know there's seven, so I believe there was seven wise men, but... <laughs> but I never can sell that idea. Um, but, but the point is, here, here in its hidden life, it's already being foreshadowed that one day the faith would go to the four corners of the world, and it's happened, hasn't it? The faith is everywhere. We've got over two billion Christians. Yeah, it's true, only half are Catholic. There's divisions, there's sin. We still grapple with sin that way. But his, his even, and I even believe that the influence of Jesus' teachings have made other people that would be a little bit more barbaric, less barbaric. It's just, I, 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 because, because of the influence of Christianity. Unfortunately, us Christians can be real pieces of work sometime and very poor examples of Christ. But I am convinced that there's many good Christians that have helped others that don't believe in Christ to take on more of the spirit of Christ. So all of this is pointed to by the visit of the Magi. Um, and the flight to Egypt is next, and I talked about how that enabled a recapitulation, just like the firstborn son Israel was brought out of the land of slavery, out of Egypt, Jesus too was brought out of Egypt. The massacre of the infants was hinting at the fact that there would be much persecution for those that accepted Jesus' teachings. And, um, and so I'm going to wrap it up there, but I think you get the idea of recapitulation. So as we continue to go through uh, these verses, uh, just be aware that it all points to who he is, the incarnation, or to his um, conquering of sin through death and resurrection. All things are pointed in one of those two directions. God bless you guys, and uh, we'll see you next week, God willing.